Since Nyserber versus Bruin was decided by the United States Supreme Court in June of this year, there's been a huge amount of Second Amendment litigation going on all across America. Rather than break down each of these specific cases, I want to talk to you about the framework that Bruin set forth for all of us to follow in Second Amendment litigations and some of the traps that the anti-gun lawyers are trying to set for us and how we can avoid them. Stay tuned. This is an important video for all of you out there, especially you judges and lawyers. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and yes, New York Times best-selling author. If you have not subscribed to The Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms, as well as for the rest of our Constitution and Bill of Rights. All right, folks, here's the story. My Serpa versus Bruin, a big case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, a lot of litigation has been going on since that case was decided. I want to talk about the methodology that the Supreme Court set forth that we all must follow in analyzing whether a modern-day gun control restriction or law violates the Second Amendment. Now, there's a process by which one goes about deciding this. And some of it's a little bit complicated. It's actually not that complicated once you break it down. But if you're not familiar with it, you haven't studied it in detail, it can be a little confusing. But I'm going to try to clear a lot of this stuff up. I'm also going to flag for you where I see the anti-gun movement trying to set traps for judges and lawyers in these courts involving Second Amendment litigations. And I'm going to identify these traps and then I'm going to hopefully give you the answer as to why they should be ignored or avoid it at all costs, not just because I say they should be avoided, but because if you apply the NYSERPA versus Bruin methodology or process for assessing Second Amendment cases, those traps are really not traps. They're really something that's a misgiving or misguidance uh, that we should simply skip, and the Supreme Court would want that to occur as well. Okay, so let us begin. Thanks to the decisions in NYSERPA versus Bruin, we know that text and history reign supreme. What does this mean? That in the past, the anti-gun lawyers and the anti-gun judges in America tried to create a, an excuse or an opportunity for judges to balance away our fundamental right to keep and bear arms. And how did they do this? The anti-gun judges and the anti-gun lawyers created what was called a tiers of scrutiny analysis, sometimes referred to as a means end analysis, where judges were allowed to consider the means of restricting guns in America and the end goal of doing so. But whatever you want to call these, whether it be intermediate scrutiny, rational basis, strict scrutiny, or means and balancing acts, at the end of the day, what these were all about was essentially letting judges, unelected judges, balance the importance of our right to keep and bear arms on the one hand against the so-called compelling or other state interests that the government asserted. And inevitably what happened in most of these cases is the judges just ruled in favor of the government, which the Supreme Court said in Heller was not acceptable. And they reaffirmed this in Bruin because specifically what the Bruin court said was that, hey, we already decided that balancing tests or tiers of scrutiny was a no-go zone. You're not allowed to consider this because any part of government cannot engage in balancing acts to balance away our Second Amendment rights. And that includes judges who, of course, are part of the government. So the Supreme Court in Heller and Bruin says no more balancing tests in terms of Second Amendment rights. Instead, what we are asking, meaning we, the Supreme Court, is asking judges to do, or actually telling them to do, um, is that they are to apply the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court and any relevant history that is associated with it. But there's a very specific way of doing this, and this is very clear. So this is the first thing I want to get to. The, this is coming a warning. This is the first warning area. Okay. Step one, to interpret the Second Amendment properly, obviously you start with the text of the Second Amendment, specifically the operative language that reads, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That is the plain text. That is the text. However, and this is very, very, very important, that text that lower courts that are also referred to as inferior courts they're called inferior courts under Article 3 of the United States Constitution because those lower federal courts are inferior to the Supreme Court 
which of course is the court that decided Heller versus DC, McDonald, Caetano, and of course, Nyserpa versus Bruin. So the Supreme Court has told the inferior courts or the lower courts how to interpret the Second Amendment. And what they said is you apply the plain text of the Second Amendment. But here's the key. When you hear the phrase apply the plain text, that does not give license to lower courts or inferior courts to make up whatever they want and to essentially review the text of the Second Amendment and engage in de novo review or some sort of tabula rasa, blank slate, writing on the wall kind of stuff. No. What the Supreme Court says is that you apply the plain text of the Second Amendment, but it's not the plain text that some lower court judge makes up. It's the plain text as interpreted by, as defined by the United States Supreme Court in their precedents from Heller to McDonald to Caetano to Bruin. The good news is the United States Supreme Court has basically defined every single critical term, and they've done so in literally dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of Supreme Court opinions laying out the definition of, um, of the people, which is all of the American people, uh, the right to keep, which means to possess, the right to bear, which means to carry in public, of course, to infringe means to abridge or to violate. And of course, we know that arms means anything that can be used offensively or defensively, supposedly bearable arms. The Supreme Court has defined these terms. So when the lower courts interpret the Second Amendment and apply the plain text, they're not allowed to make it up. They have to apply the plain text as interpreted and defined by the U.S. Supreme Court which is critically important for you to understand because a lot of these judges want to use this plain text test as an opportunity to revisit all this interpretation and all these definitions again, but they're not allowed to do that because again, the Supreme Court has already defined these things. Now beyond this, as I mentioned in prior videos, once you take the, it's not just the plain text of the Second Amendment, it's the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted and defined by Supreme Court precedent and I should also note that any necessarily implications that are derived from the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court. So, for example, we know that the Supreme Court says the right to keep and to bear arms presupposes that we have the right to acquire firearms, the right that we have the right to get them somehow. And that presupposes, of course, all sorts of ways that you can acquire firearms, whether it be by inheriting them from a gift, from buying them or from making them. So the right to keep and bear arms necessarily Im implicates things like the right to acquire, for example. All right. So let us carry on. So we now know that the step one is you take the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court and their precedents and any ne necessary implication therefrom of that text. And that basically is step one. Now, to the extent a modern day, and this is key, this is where the rubber hits the road or the fingers touch, pick the metaphor you want. Once you know the definition of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court precedent and anything necessarily implicated by, like, for example, you need to have bullets or ammunition to make an arm work, your own firearms. So that's another example of a necessary implication, or you need to have triggers, et cetera, et cetera, and gunpowder and the like. So once you know we have the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court and any necessary implications from that, those definitions, interpretations, if a modern day gun control law is implicated or restricts the right to keep and bear arms as defined by the Second Amendment, then this is key. So once that modern day gun control law restricts or limits any aspect of the plain text of the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court precedent, or any necessary implications thereof, burden now is placed on the government to show that the modern day gun control law is constitutional under the Second Amendment. So once a modern day gun control law uh, touches the right to keep and bear arms as defined by the Supreme Court, it's protected conduct under the Second Amendment. It's protected constitutional conduct. That's period, full stop, game over. Okay? Now, that gun control law has to be struck down as unconstitutional once it implicates a, a Second Amendment right. Unless, and this is the key, unless or except the following takes place. Unless or except the government is able to demonstrate that it can satisfy its legal burden to show by using historical analogs, we'll get to that in a second, by showing historical analogs that the modern day gun control law is consistent with or existed in some form in 1791. 
in the relevant time period. So again, once the modern day gun control law implicates the Second Amendment's language, as defined by the Supreme Court, the burden of proof lies with the government to show there's a historical analog in 1791 during our founding period that is sufficiently analogous and similar to what existed in the founding period to the modern-day gun control law. And if they can do that, then the modern-day gun control law can has withstood scrutiny and it can stand and it can remain on the books enforceable. But unless the government can meet its burden, then the gun control law is struck down as unconstitutional and may not be enforced. And remember that the gun rights plaintiffs have no duty or to do anything other than to show that the modern day gun control law implicates or touches fingers with the text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court. All they do, once they do that, they literally can sit on their hands and do nothing and wait to see if the government can come forth with historical analogs and history to show that the modern day gun control law existed in relevant part in 1791 or during the founding period. Now, before we talk a little bit more about a historical analog, it's critically important that you understand there's a key question before we discuss what exactly would be an appropriate historical analog sufficient to justify a modern day gun control law and allow it to withstand constitutional scrutiny. Well, obviously, to figure out if it's an appropriate historical analog, we must make sure we're looking at the right period of history. The Supreme Court in Nicerpa versus Bruin said that not all history is created equal for Second Amendment purposes. This makes a lot of sense. For example, they basically said that anything in the second, you know, anything in the 20 that just came out of the blue in the 20th century is too late of a period, no matter how you measure it, for example. But the reason why there's a scholarly debate, although not a Supreme Court debate in my opinion, about when is the relevant time period is because in 1791, when the Bill of Rights was enacted, including the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms, in 1791, when the Bill of Rights became effective, including the Second Amendment, the Bill of Rights in the Constitution really only restricted, it, it only restricted the federal government from acting. The Bill of Rights was designed to restrict the power of the federal government from encroaching on certain rights because it was the new federal government. So that was 1791. The Second Amendment is enacted, and it applies only to the federal government, not to the states. Now, in contrast, the United States fought a civil war from 1861 to 1865. After the Civil War, the United States passed three constitutional amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 14th Amendment, which had the Equal Protection Clause, the Substantive Due Process Clause, whatever you want to say, privileges and immunities, it doesn't matter right now. The point is the 14th Amendment, which is the legal tool by which the Supreme Court has decided that the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms and the rest of the Bill of Rights, by and large, has been incorporated through and applied to the states, towns, local governments, and cities is the 14th Amendment. So in 1791, the Second Amendment is created that applies just to the federal government. Then in 1868, the 14th Amendment is ratified, and the Supreme Court uses the 14th Amendment, adopted in 1868, as the instrument by which the Second Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights is incorporated against and applied to states, local, and city governments. So there's a scholarly debate on some quarters, and I think it's a minority debate and kind of a geeky thing that doesn't really count, um, as to whether or not when you apply the Second Amendment to the states, do you look at 1791, which is when the Second Amendment was written, to identify your historical analogs at that point in time, or do you look for historical analog gun control laws in the time period of 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted because that was the that's the constitutional amendment by which the Second Amendment gets incorporated against the states. The reason why there's this debate that's supposedly arisen in the courts and why there's some confusion about the relevant time period to look for historical analogs in interpreting the Second Amendment is because the anti-gun lawyers 
have immediately latched on to an argument that the relevant time period is the late 19th century because the 14th Amendment applies to the states. And that was adopted in 1868. Now, the motive for the anti-gun lawyers is quite clear because there's more gun control laws from which to look to or from which to draw from in the late 19th century than there were in the founding period. So the anti-gunners, they're not stupid. They know that it's better for their case to justify modern day gun control laws by looking to the late 19th century because there's more historical analogs then than there were in 79 when they're in the founding period. And this is, of course, uh, why are there more gun control laws in the late 19th century than 1791? A lot of it is because we had, after the Civil War, the Black Codes, or Jim Crow laws were enacted in the late 19th century, uh, and other laws like that, were, which are discriminatory against like former Confederates and the like. So there was an attempt to disarm certain unfavorable or disfavored populations, especially in the South. So we're seeing the anti-gun movement try to draw from and use these sort of black code gun control laws in the late 19th century to justify 21st century gun control laws. I don't think it's going to work, but that is why when you hear this debate, the anti-gun movement is laser focused on the late 19th century to justify everything from banning guns in church to so-called sensitive places to restrictions on the right to carry, so on and so on and so on. Because again, if you go back to the founding period, there really are no major gun control laws to speak of, uh, unlike in the late 19th century. So that is the motive for the anti-gunners to laser focus on the late 19th century and not the late 18th century. But our part of the chessboard in the gun rights movement should be to argue, and it's the correct argument, by the way, that the founding period is the relevant time period for interpreting the Second Amendment for a whole host of reasons, and I'm going to give them to you now. So I wrote a whole paper on this. I've linked to this down below, but I'm going to go over some of it again because it's so important. So the first thing to keep in mind is if you look at the Heller decision in 2008, this is not my opinion. This is the United States Supreme Court in Heller in 2008. This is what they said uh, because, you know, the Heller interpreted the Second Amendment, which when it was passed was all about restricting the authority of the federal government. Here is what Heller says, quote, not me, this is the Supreme Court, close quote, quote. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, close quote. That's what the Supreme Court said. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, close quote. Now, when, were the sec when was the Second Amendment adopted? Of course, 1791 is when the people adopted and enshrined the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. So therefore, you have to look at the 1791 founding period to interpret the scope of the Second Amendment. The second point, to, to critically important to understand about why it's the founding era and not the late 19th century, is if you look at the Supreme Court's decisions involving the incorporation doctrine. Again, the incorporation doctrine sounds fancy, but it's not that fancy. The incorporation doctrine is simply the approach or the methodology or the process that the United States Supreme Court uses to take the original Bill of Rights, which was only designed to restrict the federal government, and incorporate it, the incorporation doctrine, incorporate the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment and apply to states, cities, localities, and towns. That's the incorporation doctrine. And if you look at the incorporation doctrine cases by the United States Supreme Court, including the McDonald versus Chicago case from 2010, which is the Supreme Court case that incorporated the Second Amendment, as understood by Heller, through the 14th Amendment and applied it in that case to the city of Chicago and to all the states and cities. Um, they specifically say the following. This is what they say. This is McDonald, not me. This is the Supreme Court in the McDonald case in 2010. It says the court has, quote, decisively held, decisively held that incorporated Bill of Rights protections are all to be enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against the federal government, period, close quote. Not me, not you. The United States Supreme Court in the McDonald case in 2010 said, again, the court has, quote, decisively held that incorporated Bill of Rights protections are all to be enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against federal encroachment. 
close quote. The point being, of course, that the Supreme Court in a Second Amendment case of McDonald specifically said that when we incorporate the Second Amendment and the rest of the Bill of Rights, the standards, the scope of them, the meaning of those Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, are to be treated the same, to have the same scope and same understanding, the same definitions, the same meanings, whether you apply it against the state governments or against the federal government. So putting these two things together logically, that 1791 is the proper date for interpreting the Second Amendment as applied to the federal government, which is what Heller tells us, combining that with the McDonald statement that says that the states are to be equally bound by the same standards that apply to the federal government tells us that the exact same dates of the historical analogs, whether against the federal government or the state government, all have to be the same, which means they all have to be the founding era of 1791. Because if you don't, did not do that and you used historical analogs to interpret the Second Amendment, in the founding era and apply the Second Amendment against the federal government, and then you used a different set of historical analogs in the late 19th century for the purposes of interpreting the Second Amendment as applied to the states through the 14th Amendment, you would really have two different Second Amendments. You would have one Second Amendment defined by historical analogs from the 18th century applying to the federal government, and then you would have a second Second Amendment interpreted and applied using historical analogs from the late 19th century, after the 14th Amendment was adopted. And those would be two separate understandings of the same Second Amendment. That is violative, inappropriate, and totally unacceptable under basic black letter Supreme Court jurisprudence. You, the Supreme Court has never done that with any other aspect of the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, so on and so on. They certainly are not going to create a special set of circumstances for the Second Amendment, no matter what the anti-gunners are going to say. So that's why it has to be 1791 in terms of the, looking for the historical analogs in that time period for interpreting the scope of the Second Amendment. Now, I know this is getting a little geeky, but this is extremely important to understand. So I'm giving to you like I would give it to any judge. There are three cases that the U.S. Supreme Court cited to in Nicerpa versus Bruin to explain that historically and precedentially, the U.S. Supreme Court always interprets a Bill of Rights provision that applies to the states through the 14th Amendment the same as it was understood in 1791. What I mean by that is that there are multiple examples that I didn't cite to but the United States Supreme Court side to a nice Serpa versus Bruin that point out that you use original 1791 history to understand the scope of a Bill of Rights provision when you apply that Bill of Rights provision against states, even though the 14th Amendment comes into play. Because the only way those Bill of Rights get applied to the states is through the 14th Amendment. And that's where this question comes up or this issue appears, but again, the Supreme Court's already decided this clearly. It's always the founding era, and I'll give you three examples. And again, these are three examples Nicerpa versus Bruin specifically cited to in that case. They cite to a case called Crawford versus Washington, which interpreted the Sixth Amendment's Confrontation Clause. You have the right to cross-examine your own you know, witnesses. They're testifying against you. And when they did so, guess what? The Supreme Court in Crawford versus Washington applied founding era 1791 history to interpret the scope of the Sixth Amendment as applied to a state. Also, in a case called Virginia versus Moore, the Supreme Court in 2008 uh, applied the Fourth Amendment search and seizure restriction requirements. And guess what they use? They use founding era history to apply the Fourth Amendment against a state, uh, state actor. And then the Supreme Court in Nicerpa versus Bruin cites to Nevada Commission on Ethics versus Kerrigan, a 2011 Supreme Court case dealing with the First Amendment's right to free speech and they applied it against the state of Nevada's rules involving recusal of legislators using founding era history. So the Supreme Court in Nicerpa versus Bruin literally talked about these cases and point out that they use founding era history 
to interpret Bill of Rights provisions, even when those Bill of Rights provisions are actually applied not against the federal government, but against state actors. And that was Crawford versus Washington, Virginia versus Moore, and Nevada Commission on Ethics versus Kerrigan, all set forth by NYSERPA versus Bruin. So the Supreme Court knows that when it comes to applying the Second Amendment, which is a Bill of Rights provision, you obviously look to founding era history to interpret it and not late 19th century uh, historical analogs. Now, in those three cases the Supreme Court just cited, here's what the Supreme Court in Nicerpa versus Bruin said about those cases. The court found that the protections in those cases, quote, pegged the public understanding of the right when the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. Clear, very close quote. Again, Supreme Court said that those protections I just described in those three cases, which were Bill of Rights provisions applied against the states, quote, this is the Supreme Court in Bruin, quote, pegged to the public understanding of the right when the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791, period, close quote. Nicerpa versus Bruin, the Supreme Court said exactly that. Not me, that's the Supreme Court. So therefore, it's pretty obvious that the period of time when you interpret the Second Amendment is 1791, the founding era, and not after the Civil War, and not after the 14th Amendment, and not during the Reconstruction period. Again, this makes perfect sense because if you did it any other way, you'd have one Second Amendment for, against the federal government and a different Second Amendment applied against the states. And that is just not acceptable constitutional jurisprudence-wise. Now, a reason why the anti-gunners are trying to argue this late 19th century is because in the Ninth Serpent versus Bruin case, the Supreme Court alluded to, and they made reference to, a scholastic academic debate involving whether or not the proper period of time to interpret the Second Amendment or any aspect of the Bill of Rights is 1791, the founding period, or again, the late 19th century. But again, they reference this as a scholarly debate in certain quarters, which again, there's a whole list of scholarly debates we can get into that have no meaning to actual Second Amendment or have no meaning to real constitutional litigation. Uh, scholars talk about all sorts of things, perfectly fine to do so. But when you're litigating these cases and you're actually applying the Second Amendment in real world controversies, that scholarly debate, as far as I'm concerned, really has no meaning. They, the, the lower courts, the inferior courts, have to follow actual Supreme Court precedent, which as you can see from what I'm describing, uh, is pretty clear. Founding era tells you that is the key time period to find your historical analogs to the extent they exist. And in most instances, the government's gonna find that in 1791, there are not historical analogs to justify. Now, some of you might be asking, what is the purpose of tradition? And when do we, ever consider 19th century historical laws or history when we interpret the Second Amendment? Well, there is a very narrow exception, and this is important to understand because this is an area where there's a lot of confusion. It should not be confusing, but there is confusion. Part of the confusion, by the way, is brought about by anti-gun lawyers, in my view, trying to create the confusion to gain a competitive advantage. So here's how it works again. <clears throat> The plain text of the Second Amendment, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, triggers a burden on the part of the government to the extent that there's a modern-day gun control law that impinges on you know, the right to keep and bear arms as understood by the Supreme Court. Now, the government then has to show a historical analog at the founding era. We just went over this. So that's text, if you will, and that's history, if you will. So the text is the plain text as interpreted by the, as, as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And then the History is the role of the government trying to come forth with historical analogs to show that there are historical analogs to justify the modern day gun control law. And to the extent they fail to do so, then the history, you know, rules in our favor, if you will. So where does the word tradition play a role? And why would the Supreme Court ever talk about the late 19th century in any respect if they only have to look at 1791 in the founding period? And here's the answer. When you hear the standard of text, history, and tradition, tradition is, and this is a key, tradition is a confirmatory analytic. A confirmatory analytic. And what does that mean? A confirmatory analytic is like a one-way ratchet. It can only go one way. A confirmatory analytic from the late 19th century is history that confirms, that affirms 
that corroborates, if you will, the understanding that was drawn from 1791 of, or the founding era of what the Second Amendment meant. What I mean by this is, you look first to 1791 to understand the meaning of the Second Amendment. A judge is then permitted to look to the late 19th century as part of a tradition to see if a tradition confirms or reaffirms that his or her understanding of the Second Amendment as interpreted in 1791 is the same as the late 19th century. If the answer is yes, it is, a judge is allowed to use that tradition of that gun law or that tr tradition of no gun control law to show that the 1791 conclusion as to what the Second Amendment meant then is confirmed by the traditions of the late 19th century. It can confirm your conclusion about 1791. But here's the key. What late 19th century historical analogs or late 19th century post-Civil War law, law or post-Civil War history cannot do, it cannot do, is it cannot contradict or undermine the understanding of the Second Amendment as it was understood in 1791. So again, when you hear about the text and the history, you all know what that is. The tradition component of text, history, and tradition, the tradition refers to using late 19th century or post-founding era period law in American history to confirm one's understanding of the 1791 Second Amendment. It can confirm. That's what tradition can do. But it cannot undermine or contradict the 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment. Now, this is not what I say. This is what Judge Brett Kavanaugh articulated so clearly in a case called Heller II when he dissented in a so-called assault weapon ban case when he sat on the D.C. Court of Appeals. And he explained exactly what I just said, that the role of tradition is a confirmatory ratchet to confirm what the 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment meant, it cannot contradict it. And that is what Bruin said as well. So again, the text, the history, and the tradition, and the tradition is the confirmatory analytic, and that's all it is. But what the anti-gunners are trying to use tradition as is to say, yeah, we understand 1791, you had all these gun rights under the Second Amendment, but we can show that there was these gun control laws in the late 19th century but they can't use it that way because they would be using historical analogs, historical analogs from the late 19th century to justify modern-day gun control laws that contradict or undermine the limit, the, 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 the understanding of the Second Amendment in 1791. And they're not allowed to do that because, again, tradition can only serve to confirm the text and the history. It cannot undermine or contradict the text and the history of the Second Amendment. All right. So for today, that is all we're going to talk about today. The next video I'm going to shoot separately, because this is already a long one, I'm going to talk specifically how you apply historical analogs and what constitutes an appropriate historical analog in interpreting the Second Amendment in the founding era period and some other traps that the anti-gunners are trying to set for us. But for now, I hope you understand the text, the history, and the tradition of the Second Amendment and the time periods for interpreting this and some of the other traps. But again, we have a lot more to cover, and this is very important because this is even judges could potentially get this wrong if they're not careful and they don't read these cases carefully and they don't study it appropriately. So that's why I'm taking my time to go through this because it's mission critical that we all in the Second Amendment community get this right because if we get this wrong, there's a danger that we will lose critical rights uh, in our right to keep mirror arms, and we don't want to do that. Okay, hope you learned a little bit something here today. Sorry for being a little geeky, but I think it's important. And uh, again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.